Welcome to Calgary Life Church. Happy Easter, everybody. The Lord is risen. And you respond, He is risen indeed. Let's do that again. The Lord is risen. Oh, you did that so good. Well, it's so great to uh, celebrate the resurrection of our Savior with you today. And uh, our theme is hope starts here. And there is hope. And we're going to be talking about hope today. And especially the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I want to welcome all of you that are tuning in from uh, all the different platforms that uh, we uh, uh, you know, have th this uh, program running on. Uh, would you do us a favor and give us a shout out and tell us where you are watching from? We, we're having thousands of people tune in from all over the world. And could you let us know where you're watching from, what country, you know, someone says from the couch. Well, that's great too, but we're so delighted to have you with us. And uh, if you're uh, looking for a more interactive platform, I encourage you to come to calgarylifechurch.com, come to our website, and uh, there's chat rooms, there's interaction, we have hosts and prayer partners ready, and uh, we just uh, are so grateful that uh, you've opened up uh, your home to us, and I'm just trusting that the message I share today is going to just minister God's peace, it's going to give you hope, it's going to bring encouragement, because let me tell you, my friend, God is with you. He's for you. You are loved by God. He's not against you. And uh, he is a rock that you can turn to. He is a, a help in this, in this season that we're going through. And we're all going through this together. But today I want to talk to you about the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And our theme verse is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to how it reads in the NIV. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Is that a powerful verse? That we've got a new birth. We've got a brand new start in life. We've been born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our hope is alive because Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. We have a living hope because we have a living Savior. And so when I think about who wrote this, and so if you are new to Christianity or checking things out, let me tell you who Peter is. Peter, uh, it, it's, it's very you know, interesting that he wrote this about having a living, a living hope because uh, he's someone that completely lost hope. And when you, we find the story of Peter, you'll discover that uh, he was a fisherman, he was a business person. One day he had spent the whole night fishing, he never caught anything. And uh, Jesus needs his boat as a, as a platform to preach to the multitudes. And so he borrows his boat and uh, preaches his message. And Peter was, you know, washing and mending the nets. And then at the end of his sermon, Peter says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, he says, uh, come on, let's go out there and let down your nets for a big catch of fish. And Peter's like, man, Jesus, I've worked all night. There's no fish. I'm done. I'm tired. My nets are dry. They're mended. I want to go home. But then he says, well, nevertheless, at your word, just because you said so. So evidently, there must have been something in the words of Jesus that resonated with Peter. He puts down his nets and he catches a massive load of fish that has started to sink his boat. And so immediately he falls on his knees and, and uh, the Bible says that he leaves everything and he follows Jesus. He leaves his business. He leaves his reputation. He becomes a Christ follower. He becomes part of the, uh, the inner circle, one of the inner three in Jesus, uh, uh, out of Jesus' 12. And he was uh, privy to a lot of different uh, uh, things that the other disciples didn't get to see. For example, when he raised uh, uh, the little girl from the dead or when he was transfigured on the mountain and Moses and Elijah appeared beside him and he was covered in a shining you know, light and he was, I mean, it was an incredible experience. And then also when he was praying, when Jesus was going through the prayers in Gethsemane, you know, crying out you know, to God and you know, facing the... the, the uh, crucifixion and uh, Peter was there with him in those three moments and uh, what we find about Peter is that he uh, he loses hope he really believed that through Jesus Christ that the Romans would be overthrown Israel would be liberated Jesus would establish a new kingdom and he'd get to sit on one of those thrones he'd get to be part of the you know the ruling elite so to speak but then when the night when Jesus basically informs the disciples that not only was he going to be crucified that night and be delivered to the hands of the Romans, that one of them would betray him. Well, Peter stood up and said, not so, Lord, that's not going to happen, not me, I'll never do it. And then uh, 
Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, he says, you know what? The devil, you know, he's desired to sift you as wheat, you know, and I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. But, you know, when you return, in other words, you're not going to pass the test, Peter. You're going to fail. When you return, strengthen your brothers, man. I'm going to use your failure. Peter would have nothing to do with that. He said, no. He said, I'm willing to go to prison and I'm willing to go to the, go to the, go to the death, you know, for, you know, for you, Jesus. I'm not leaving you. Peter, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, by the time the, 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 the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. And he said, never. Well, a few hours later, we find Peter fleeing like the rest of them. Even though he swore to Jesus, I'll never leave you. Now he's left Jesus and he's following Jesus from a distance. I think that's always a problem. There's a lot of people that follow Jesus from a distance. They don't quite get in on the front row. They're waiting, watching to see what would happen. Peter comes to the fire and begins to warm himself and three times says, you know the story, he denies Jesus and once even to a little girl. And on the last time when he denies Jesus, he hears a rooster crow and he looks up and one gospel version tells us that Jesus made eye contact with Peter. Peter was broken. He went out and he wept bitterly. He lost hope. And so here's, Jesus, here's Peter who forsook everything to follow Jesus. And, and now he's faced with two great disappointments. One life just never turned out the way he thought it was going to turn out. You know, I think a lot of us could relate to that today right now. We didn't expect that this was going to happen. We didn't expect that we were going to be, you know, isolated and have social distancing and that, you know, that we would be under this, uh, this fear of this, this, uh, this COVID virus that, is, that has changed the world. And so there's a lot of fear. And so there's a lot of things aren't working. A lot of people's economies have been, have been uh, uh, shaken and changed. And there's so much insecurity. And here's Peter thinking, I followed Jesus. I thought it was, my life was going to turn out different. And then I think the other disappointment was what he had, you know, he had control over. And that was his own attitudes. And he saw his own personal failures. And he had promised Jesus that he would never fail him. <clears throat> Excuse me, that he would never betray him. And then he looked into the eyes of Jesus as he's being tortured. And he denies him even before a little girl. And he went out and he wept barely. Three days later, as the story goes on, you find out that Jesus is raised from the dead. But what does Peter do? He decides to go back fishing. We find it in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. He says to disciples, I'm going fishing. Why would he go fishing? Why would he go back? It's because he had so lost hope. And so here we have, that's the story of Peter. And the good news is, is that Jesus restores him. But he writes this verse and he says that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My friend, let me tell you that because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have a living hope. And Peter made an incredible comeback. And I'm just believing that you too, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, more than just a historical fact or a doctrine or a creed, but through the power of the resurrected Jesus, the one who was, who is, and is to come, that your hope can become living. Not a dead hope, not a false hope, but a real hope for this difficult season that we're going through together. All right, so some people say, well, isn't Christianity kind of like a, you know, a candy cotton religion? You know, it's good looking and it's well tasting, but it's, but it's just empty on the inside. It just vanishes. There's no substance to it. Let me tell you, my friend, that the gospel is God, it still is the power of God for salvation, for forgiving, for forgiveness, for life transformation. And so let's talk about hope. Because I want to talk about the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the world's definition of hope is this. According to Webster's Dictionary, it's a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. The world's definition of hope is not theological, it's psychological. It, firstly, it's wishful thinking. Uh, it's to be optimistic, and optimism only works if you can control all the outcomes. Uh, I, for example, I have a hope that the NHL season is going to get back on track. Any kind of sports, uh, curling even, uh, lawn darts, I'll take any sports right now uh, to get back on television. I'd love to see something that's not a replay. Uh, I have a hope to win the Lotto Max, but you know, that's just, uh, that's, that's just wishful thinking. And uh, you can't build your life on that kind of hope. And uh, it's wishful thinking. It denies reality. But that's the only kind of hope the world can offer. Uh, the Bible talks about a different kind of hope. Uh, the biblical definition of hope is this. It's a confident expectation 
of what God has promised and its strength is in his faithfulness. Let me tell you, my friend, God is a promise-making God and he is a promise-keeping God. You can build your life on the, the foundation of God's word. And I'm telling you, my friend, that God backs up every promise. Every promise in this book is yes and in Christ, it's amen. God is for you, my friend. Our hope is built on the fact that God gives us certain promises and that he backs them up. And you can, you can lean on that. You can lean on the, on the promises of God. Not one person has ever broken a promise of God by leaning on it. It will sustain you. God's word will see you through. His faithfulness will see you through this, this difficult season. It's not based on wishful thinking. It's not based on your performance. Come on, Peter, he failed miserably. He failed before Jesus. But Jesus said, hey, Peter, when you turn, you know what? When you, when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. Listen, you can go through failure. You can mess it up. But God never mistakes the man for the moment. He still has a plan for you, my friend. Listen, there's resurrection life. There's resurrection power available for each and every one of us. You can have a living hope today because our Savior is alive. And Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, that's great for Jesus. But you know what he said? In the world, we would have tribulation, but he's overcome the world. In other words, he's overcome the world for you and I. So we can walk in his victory. We can walk in his presence. We can walk in his peace. We don't have to live, you know, with the hopelessness and with the fear that's in this world. We can walk in, 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 a, in a confidence because we have a living hope. Not the world's hope, but a God kind of hope. I hope this is helping somebody here today. In, back in December, I did a whole series on hope. And uh, I, never, I didn't realize back then that God was speaking prophetically for this season. And when I think about some of those verses that we shared and we talked about, I really believe, church, that God was preparing us as a family to get ready for this season. So I want to remind you about one of our key verses from that hope series. It was found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. It says, this hope, oh, I like that. It didn't talk about the world's hope. It doesn't just talk about a generic hope or a false hope. It's talking about this hope, this living hope that is connected to a person, not a doctrine. This living hope, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Isn't that good news? My friend, I, listen, listen to me. My soul needs an anchor. In this season, especially, your soul needs an anchor. And ships have anchors for, for three reasons. Number one is when, when they come into harbor and they're going to be at rest, they drop anchor. My friend, you can find rest through the promises of God. You can find rest in the presence of Jesus. Why? Because you know what? We have this hope. It's an anchor for our soul. The other time that the ships use uh, anchors is when there's a storm and they need just to, just to you know, just to keep that, that majority of weight below the surface of the water. So they, they drop anchor even in the midst of storms. And so in the midst of this storm, you've got to put your anchor down deep into God, into his love for you, into his peace and his promises, my friend. You know what? Stay connected in community and, uh, it, you know, on the connect groups. We have so many different connect groups that are meeting online through all the different uh, you know, video platforms. And I encourage you, don't, don't weather the storm alone. Christianity is not an island religion. It's a community. It's a family. We go through this together. I need you. You need me. We need fellowship. Fellowship, I said this before, is more than friendship. F fellowship is a Christ-centered relationship. It's where we talk about Jesus and remind ourselves about his promises and his goodness and his faithfulness. And the third reason why, you know, why uh, ships have anchors is because they'll drift if they don't, they, don't, they don't drop that anchor. And it's so easy to drift into malaise. It's easy to drift into depression. Peter had said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to what I knew before. I'm giving up on all this thing, man. I'm just going to go back and I just, you know, what, what was that? That was the voice of a defeated soul. That is the voice of depression speaking. He says, this was too traumatic. I put all my hopes and dreams in Jesus, and then he's crucified. I thought he was going to be the one that was going to bring the kingdom of God back into, you know, you know, and overthrow those Romans, those pesky Italians. They're wrecking everything. And yet, hope died. You see, there's a, but there's another kind of hope. It's a living hope. And so, when we talk about the gospel, the resurrection, so absolutely vital it's the cornerstone of the Christian faith. It's more than a doctrine. So listen to, because uh, uh, it's important to, to recognize, what are you anchored to? I'm anchored to Jesus, the one who died for our sins, was justified and rose up from the grave. 
Not only did he rise up from the grave, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the head of all principality and power. My hope is anchored behind the veil into that presence, into the presence of Jesus. His presence is the anchor for my soul. Oh, I just feel the peace of God right now. And I trust that wherever you're watching, that you too can just find that peace that comes from the presence of Jesus. That's the anchor for our soul. And uh, what's your soul anchored to? What are you tethered to? Are you anchored to fear? Are you anchored to hopelessness? Are you, are you anchored to, disp- to depression or anger or bitterness in this moment? My friend, put your trust in God. He's for you. He's gonna, he, listen, he's going to see you through this. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 17, uh, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? As I said, res- the resurrection is the cornerstone of Christianity. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He, is, he raised up Christ whom he, did not, if, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see, this is what separates Christianity from every other religion. The power of our gospel is the fact that Jesus is still alive, that he's been raised from the dead. That is the foundation of our faith. And it wasn't an empty tomb that transformed those 11 11 timid disciples. They were defeated and discouraged and they were transformed into radical world changers. Why? It's not because they discovered an empty tomb. It's because they met a resurrected Christ. And so they they didn't go, they didn't develop studies around Jesus' teachings and his politics and, you know, but they went around and joyfully witnessed and testified that they had met a living Savior. And that's our message to you today, that Jesus is alive. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Come on, somebody. He is with you. He's for you. And he loves you. He's the undefeated one. And this is what separates, you know, our faith from all the major religions of the world. Uh, For example, you know, Abraham, the founder of Judaism, he died in 1900 B.C. uh, In 1900 B.C., in 493 B.C., BC, the Buddha died. In 632 A.D., on June the 6th, Muhammad died. In A.D. 33, Jesus died. The difference between Jesus and the previous three is that Jesus is alive today. His tomb is empty, and that's where our faith is. And you know, that, that, that's what separates. Why it's, that's, no other religion can, you know, has as one of their understanding un, uh, tenets that you can commune with the founder, that you can be in relationship with them, and that you can talk to them and, and pray, and they will answer prayers. But only we find this in the Christian faith. And so uh, uh, that is, that's, that's, that's good news today. And you know what? The fact that they met a living Christ and he started a movement. He didn't come to start, you know, an organization or simply rules and a religion. He came to start a movement, a family, a group of people that experience him, that he's alive, that he pulls us out of darkness and takes our feet out of the miry clay and puts us on solid rock and brings us into his family and puts on us a robe of righteousness. Come on, what, what an awesome message that we have. And he works a miracle on the inside of us and this Jesus is still a miracle working Jesus and and that resurrected Jesus still has an impact today. In AD 100 there was about 100 people a day that was coming to Christ. Well in the year 2000 it it escalated over 200,000 people every day are coming to faith in Christ. Al Jazeera uh, reported that 16,000 Muslims a day in Africa are coming to Jesus. Why is that happening? It's because Christ said, he gave us his word in Matthew 28, 30, he said, and surely I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And Jesus is still with us. Come on, confirming the word with signs following. That's why we are part of the fastest growing movement that history has ever seen. So how does that resurrection, uh, you know, what significance does that have for me today? And maybe you're wondering, what hope can I find in that? 
resurrection of Jesus today. Let me tell you the first thing, the first anchor that you need to put down deep into your soul. Whether you are a follower of Jesus or you're just checking things out, I want you to hear this because God loves you. God has a plan for your life. Come on. You listen, you, you, you've been listening and, and wondering what's going on and maybe you think about people that have misrepresented Jesus. And I listen, I, listen if you don't carry the heart of Jesus, please don't put his name on your lips. And I, I'm sorry for those that have misrepresented you know, the whole message of, of Christianity. Even today, there are people that are talking about this COVID as being a a sign of the wrath of God. My friend, listen, Jesus took the wrath. He drank that cup. There is no more wrath from God, you know, for our sins because Jesus paid the full price. And that's my first point. The first miracle, the first anchor that you can put your soul in is this, the guarantee that your sins are forgiven. That's what Peter experienced. Listen to Romans chapter four, verse 25. It says, he was handed over to die for our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. You see, he died because of our sins because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the good news is he didn't stay dead. Why? Because the price was paid for completely. And once that price was paid for completely, death had no more claims to the body of Jesus. And the resurrection is that proof that it was paid in full. When a prisoner, see, Jesus' last words on the cross, some of his last words was, uh, was the word, Testali, and I'm sorry, you know, tetelestai, sorry to all my Greek friends, uh, sorry, nectaria, you know, uh, it means, it's this word that was, that was stamped on a certificate when the bill had been paid. When a prison term had been fully served and fully commuted, they would stamp on that, you know, you know, tetelestai, which meant, you know, served in full, paid in full, no more, there's no more punishment and no more debt. When Jesus was on the cross, when he said, it is finished, no, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What? The penalty for your sin and my sin is finished. There's no more debt. The the prison sentence canceled, done, is fully served by Jesus. There's no more punishment and there's no more debt for the believer. That's why the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? And, uh, In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, listen to this verse. It says, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The charges that were against you, the charges that were against me, they were nailed to Christ's cross and we are forgiven. You are forgiven. You say, well, I don't feel forgiven. Well, maybe you just need to, maybe it's time for you to quit following Jesus from afar like Peter did, got him in all kinds of trouble. Maybe it's time for you to come to Jesus and accept your forgiveness, accept your acceptance. He already forgave you. He, he already did everything for you. He's just calling you now to accept it. So that's the first point. How does the resurrection affect me today? It's the guarantee. The resurrection is the guarantee that my sins are forgiven and there's now no condemnation. You will never stand before God and give an account for your sins. Why? Because God doesn't know them. God doesn't know them. He cast them into the sea of his forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed our iniquities from us. That's the good news, my friend, is that you can have a clean conscience. You can experience the greatest miracle of forgiveness. You can stand before God. The Bible says that we are justified by faith, not by works, but by faith. What does that mean? It means that you, through the gift of God, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, not eternal church services, not eternal religion, not eternal list of rules, but it's life. It's a life that is free. It's a life that is forgiven. It's a life that's been raised from the dead and has been giving a living hope that we are forever connected with Christ in his life, in his his death, burial, resurrection. We are in him. We live and move and have our being. Christ in me and us in Christ. That's the miracle, my friend. That's the miracle of the new birth. The resurrection talks about, you know, the mercies of God that gave us a new birth through the living hope. The new birth is the life of Christ comes into us and makes us brand new on the inside. And that brings me to my second point here. You know, uh, the, the good news about the, the resurrection, the living hope, and the second anchor is this, is that I'm free from the power of my past. You see, that's where Peter, he thought, I blew it. I denied Jesus three times and one time. It, but I was intimidated by a little girl by the fire. When I denied Jesus, even though I promised him, I said I would die with, for him. I would go to prison for him. And then when he denied Jesus, is he being beaten by those guards? 
Jesus makes eye contact with Peter. And he went out and he wept bitterly. I failed. I'm so weak. He overestimated his strength. He followed from afar. And he just, you know, it, it, his life was unraveling, was falling apart. And I meet people all the time that have made some pretty big mistakes. You know, there's a verse in the Psalms where David said, man, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. And I begin to think about that. You know what? If I make, if I make my bed in hell, a lot of people make their bed in hell right here on earth. You know what? You you make a bad choice. You make a bad decision. You say something you shouldn't have said. You've trespassed. What does that mean? You've gone somewhere where you should not have gone. You crossed the line somewhere, maybe morally, maybe sexually, maybe with your words or, you know, maybe financially or whatever it is. You, you've, you've done something and you might think you've just disqualified yourself and you think that, that God has forgotten you and that God is against you and, you know, and that, that's it. You, you know, it's like that, the old poem where the bird that's with the broken wing, the, the wing will heal, but it'll never fly as high as it would before. Guess God can never trust me again. My friend, let me tell you that this gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation to whoever believes. Listen, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. This is for somebody. This is for several people. You just think that God is against you. But I, can, can I read something for you? You know, after Peter denied Jesus in his weakest moment when he needed a friend and Peter, to the face of Jesus, denied him in front of a little girl. Listen to what happened on the resurrection morning. This is why we have a living hope. And it says that, and uh, so the, uh, the women had come to, you know, to visit the tomb and they meet an angel. And uh, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, oh, I like this, that he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. But, uh, isn't that amazing? You know, that the angel says, make sure you go tell the disciples, and especially Peter, especially Peter. Why? Before Jesus was going to go back to heaven, there was a relationship that needed restoration. Isn't that the goodness of God? Isn't that the living hope? You might think that you've broken, you know, your relationship with God and you've, you've committed the unpardonable sin. I'm telling you, my friend, you can't commit the unpardonable sin. You know what, it's like if, you, if you're watching this program right now and you're feeling, you know, this, this remorse for something you've said or done or the direction that you've gone or you've drifted. Maybe you've just drifted from faith and you've become despondent and you've gone back fishing. You've gone back to your old life. You're no longer in that presence. You know, you've just felt like this season has been so hard on you. It's drained you of your hope and of your energy and, and of your optimism and you feel like the dream has died and you're, you're given up on the inside. My friend, let me tell you, is when Jesus came out of that grave, he didn't just come for his disciples and he came for his disciples and and Peter and you come on he's he made a point of it I'm going to make sure that that re relationship gets restored and you know the story he restores that incredible relationship my friend your best days are still ahead of you you are not you know and that 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 regret is like a soul cancer it was eating up Peter on the inside. It robbed him of his life. It robbed him of his inner strength. But my friend, we have a living hope. And that is this, that even in the midst of your failure, God is still bigger than your problem. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Now, I'm not advocating going out as making many problems as you can you know, because you don't want to make your bed in hell. But you can, make, you can bring hell into your life. And let me tell you, he is there. He is there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. You are with me. God will never give up on you. God will never give up on his purpose for your life. He'll never give up loving you. He'll never give up coming after you. He's never going to give up on you because His grace is stronger than your sin. Come on, somebody. That's a good place to raise your hands and praise God right now. So listen to this verse. And with this, we'll be coming in for our landing, for our close here. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe? according to the working of His mighty power, which we worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of heavenly places. My friend, you know what kind of life that you have when you receive Christ? You get resurrection life, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It comes to live on the inside of you. And what does it do? It comes to make you a new creation. You know, oh, I love this. At the cross of Jesus Christ, your old history died. And at the resurrection of Jesus, your new history begins. Jesus took your history to the grave. When Christ died, you died with him. When Christ rose up from the grave, we were identified 
we were united in him. And so our old past was buried and our new future is as bright as the power of God, the resurrection life. Second Corinthians 5.17 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You know, maybe your heart is heavy today. Maybe your heart is stained. Maybe you feel your heart is cold. Maybe your heart is turned back. Let me tell you, my friends, that God wants to give you a new nature. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new and are of God. Behold, can I encourage you to start putting your beholding on the things that, that Christ makes new, the things that Christ raises from the dead? Come on, you've got a living hope. Put your faith in Jesus. He loves you. He's, he wants you to experience. Paul, Paul prayed, oh, that I would know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection power of His resurrection. My friend, have you experienced the power of the resurrection? Have you been born again into a living hope because of the mercies of God? Peter, he, that was our opening verse. He was one that his life didn't turn out the way he thought it was going to. He didn't think that he was going to mess up as bad as he did. But he writes to us, he says, man, through the mercies of God, we got a fresh start, a new beginning. And my friend, that's my prayer for you, is that you discover this power of a new beginning that you experience the forgiveness of sins, that you experience the power to become what God intended for you to become. And li listen to this verse. In, uh, and my last point is this about the fresh start. Uh, you know, the power of this gospel is that it's the end of religion, of trying harder. You know, uh, uh, look, look in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18 to 19 in the Living Bible, it says this, that old system, you know, just religion, whatever you try to do to uh, attain a certain level of righteousness was canceled. Why? Because it didn't work. Religion doesn't work. It was weak and useless. Come on, you're hearing it from a pastor here saying right now, religion is weak and useless in, for saving people. Because what happens is people make up a, their own righteousness. They make a standard of living, you know, a standard of do's and don'ts. They judge themselves by it. And of course, they're perfect and everybody else is, is guilty, you know, and it's just arrogance. And so here it says, that, and it never made anybody really right with God. But now we have a far better hope. What do we have? A far better hope for Christ makes us acceptable to God. Then Romans 8, 13 says in the Message Bible, the best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. My friend, take your past, take your fears, take your problems, take the hell that you've made and just give it a decent burial, burial and just come to Christ and let's get on and begin to live this new life because God is calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you today. Where you're watching all, all over right now, I want to give you an opportunity to receive. I'm not asking you to, to believe in a doctrine of the resurrection or to adhere to a creed or try to attain to a certain level of do's and don'ts. I'm here asking you to accept the good news that at the cross, Christ forgave you. He paid for it once and for all. And you can have this solid hope on the inside of you. And uh, it comes through receiving a person by believing in this resurrected one, by entrusting your life to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you right now to entrust your life, to give your life, to put your trust in Him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the Word says this, for as many as received Jesus. You know, from wherever you're watching, I travel the world and I speak in a lot of nations that have a lot of Christians and a lot of times they... People like I myself, I grew up believing in Jesus. I followed from afar, just like Peter did, but I had never received Jesus into my life. And what happens when you receive Jesus, it says, for, uh, for as many as received him to those, he gives the power to become a child of God. What kind of power? Resurrection power comes in and raises, you know what, just raises you up and it unites you. Just You receive that forgiveness of sins, that peace with God. You know, you can have the, the peace of God. You, can, you have the peace with God, so you can have the peace of God. It's a miracle, my friends. Yeah, Christianity is all about miracles. Jesus, His birth was a miracle. His teaching was miraculous. His ministry was miraculous. His resurrection is miraculous. And His indwelling, it's a miracle. What you need today is a miracle. And Jesus is a miracle worker. He wants to work a miracle in your life. You can experience Him, him today because he said he would never leave you nor forsake you. So why don't you just open up your heart right now? The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, you will be saved. For, you know, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. 
you know, and you're saved. It's simple as that. Simply by receiving Jesus. Yeah, that's what the Word says. So just say right now, just you can repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I can't save myself, my good intentions, good works. They're not good enough. So I turn to you, Jesus, and I receive you. I welcome you into my life. Thank you for forgiving me. I accept it. Thank you for loving me. I accept it. And thank you for giving me a living hope and a future. I receive it. I'm yours, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> That's so awesome. Hey, they're on your, your screen right now if you're watching on the online uh, platform from Calgary Life Church. A little button just went up and it just says you can raise your hand. And when you do that, we have a, a host that's going to pray with you. And uh, if you'd be so kind as to give us your address, I'd like to send you this booklet called Why Jesus by Nikki Gumbel. It's just a little seed that we want to sow into your life that just to, to help you to, uh, to grow in this new faith and this relationship that you got with Jesus. And so it's just a free gift from us to you. And uh, we look forward to uh, sending this to you. Uh, as we close, let me, just, uh, let me just finish with this great verse. Let me just encourage you, church. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Who is he? He's the God of all hope. He will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Don't stop believing, church. Come on, some of you have faced some pretty tough stuff. You, you've got your layoffs or you've got, you know, people that are in isolation or battling the sickness or the fear. Let me tell you, the God of peace, the God of hope will fill you with joy and peace in believing. Don't, let, don't, don't turn loose of your faith. And it says that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We so absolutely love you. We so looking forward and we can get together and celebrate and shout together and, and, uh, and shake hands and hug and do whatever, you know. And uh, it's going to be awesome. But until then, church, let's stay connected online. Uh, let's stay connected in our connect groups. There's some Zoom rooms that are open right now. And uh, if you just want to talk to somebody with a face on, uh, just follow one of the links that are available on the screen right now and look forward to connecting with you during the week. God bless you. We'll love you. Jesus is alive. He's risen and He is Lord. Thank you.